You may have heard that around 1700 Corelli was considered as an ideal of compositional craft. Well, let's say he was more like a living legend whose impact on the musical world just cannot be overestimated. He inaugurated a style that has been studied and copied all over Europe and became something like a universal model that earned him the name New Orpheus. Prince of Musicians, since he totally blew up with his trio sonatas that went into print, which was a big thing back in the day. Just to exemplify how far that hype actually went, the French composer François Couperin even composed an outright pastiche that's imitating Corelli's style. The reason why Corelli makes such a good model to study is that he was able to fabricate great emotional effect and structural beauty within a dandyish minimum of technical effort and thus created a musical language of incomparable efficiency. Not to diminish the sheer mastery of all this, one could undoubtedly state that he was a composer that juggled with a recognizable template of generic building blocks. But in fact, a lot of these musical gestures turned out to be downright classics and it's exactly exactly those components that you should study thoroughly if you really want to understand the language of baroque music. And now this may probably irritate you. From a certain methodical perspective, the go-to guy of today's academic tonal theory teaching and designated master of masters just doesn't really suit as compositional model for beginners. There is a certain true essence in the fact that Bach was perceived by some of his 18th century contemporaries as being eccentric and overly complicated. I directly translate into a language that any millennial watching can understand. This guy's music is pure cringe because he's trying too hard to be special. Well, one could state the jealous hater just didn't get it, but I actually can see his point. Although relying on the same building blocks, syntactical elements and basically the same musical language as any other baroque composer, the lush complexity of figurative decorations in many cases conceals the underlying scaffolding architecture to a degree that those basic components become hard to identify at all, whilst in Corelli those are always recognized on the very foreground. Another thing is that Bach, like no other Baroque composer, showed a willingness to tolerate much more figurative dissonance, harshness and vertical compromises in general than his contemporary colleagues. Along to that, a general tendency that even increases towards his mature and later style can be described as a gradual replacement of the established generic pattern-based melodic approach that defined the musical Baroque in the first place by a rather individualized melodic style that became his unmistakable hallmark. Whilst this example is admittedly completely far off, I guess skeptical critics were rather more referring to stuff like this. Or maybe this example. get me wrong here. This is excellent music and I love it like everybody else, but what I'm trying to say is that we're so used to this guy's music that we forget how strange and unconventional it actually is in comparison to other baroque composers. So come back to him when you studied your Corelli and you'll see everything with different eyes. I promise, he's still gonna be a maniac, but after all much more relatable. And now let's check out this Corelli. And we're gonna do it like this. How about a little game? Let's listen to this very short 12 bar long trio sonata movement and your task is to count all cadences that you're able to recognize. So how many cadences do you count? Let's go! I guess it's five. Besides one very strong half cadence that divides the piece into halves, there is four other ones that are all of the same structural origin that's commonly referred to as cadenza doppia or double cadence. All in all, cadences make at least 50% of the music you've just heard. Strange, isn't it? So let's go a little deeper into that. Many seem to think that the cadenza doppia is just a long five and thus recognizable by this property solely. 
whereas the main component actually is a certain melody that mostly appears in one of the upper voices. From this melody the term double cadence becomes clearer as it shows two soprano clauses. The other signature component is the syncopation which makes this device easy to recognize even in a score of multiple voices. Actually every multi-voice fabric that's built around this kind of melody is a doppia and the long 5 in the bass is just one among others. Now soprano clause in the middle voice. And as I said could as well be put to the bottom. In Corelli's piece you can see this melody appear above several different bass lines and of course even a little piece does modulate so you can see double cadences that confirm different keys. But for now let's just focus on these two G minor cadences. That very last one sounds like this. That cadence in the first part though looks pretty similar but has a different bass line. This diagram is supposed to show that Corelli obviously assigns two alternative bass lines to the same upper voice fabric. What can be confusing for beginners is that if you just take the bass perspective, the different melodic shape and thus different thorough bass figures don't make this immediately visible. That bass line on the bottom is not just an arbitrary version, but more like a standard pattern and you can spot it in the piece a second time but related to B flat major. See, 56451 is exactly the same. Another thing, if you practice and transpose those cadences at the keyboard, take into consideration that the upper voices are exchangeable. Here you have the two cadences, now with the soprano clause in the highest voice. There is another very common doppia variant in that piece, but that's related to C minor, which you can recognize by the double soprano clause that requires a B natural. You can see that there is another different bass line. That's what I call the doppia above the tight bass, as this cadence occurs above a syncopated bass note that's always the local fourth degree. And I recommend to train this as well as transposable building block. <laughs> So let me summarize. We have three different standard double cadences. The long 5, the 5, 6, 4, 5, 1 and the tight bass. There's actually a lot more variants and bass lines, but I consider these the absolute standards. For my students I design partimenti that train distinctive individual building blocks and one subgenre of that are entire pieces or let's say etudes that train exclusively cadences. So in this partimento you will mainly see the three doppia cadences just discussed. This is not primarily about making nice music but more like driven by the idea of creating a most efficient exercise. Now let's focus on this one, as this seems to be one of the most common variants. Especially confusing for newcomers can be the identification of double cadences in an original partimento and that's why I want to raise your awareness for the indicating signs. In number 8 of his second book, Fenaroli comes up with two identical situations of the tight bass with an indicated triton above it on the downbeat. That's followed by a 5-1 nearby after and this should definitely trigger your doppia alert system. Hence, one of the participating upper voices should come up with that specific doppia soprano clause. 
the sake of variety and to prevent redundance, I put the soprano clause at first on the top voice and into the middle voice in the second one. In number six of the same book, you can recognize a very similar situation of two consecutive double cadences above the tight bass, but that's a little bit more advanced as this time they are related to different keys. That D major cadence is the primary modulation of the initial key, so bear in mind that this Doppia variant is a first rate modulator. This in sanguine shows besides a confirmation of the initial key both primary modulations of A minor. So even if those three cadences may look slightly different, they all have the tight bass in common and one of the participating upper voices thus should provide the necessary counterpart, by which I mean the doppia soprano clause of the local key. <laughs> some further ideas. It's definitely a healthy exercise to detach such a bassline from the original composition and play around with it for some time. I took Corelli's bassline and tried to come up with a figuration prelude on it, which actually turned out to be a very hard task for me and I'm not a hundred percent convinced of the outcome, but I'm gonna share my attempt anyway, so let's give it a listen! <laughs> better as I remember it. Another but more demanding exercise would be to try to compose or to improvise a Corellian slow movement. Of course after you analyze a bunch of them. But I want to pour in a little disclaimer on this occasion. If you browse through YouTube's Partimento bubble for a bit, it's close to impossible that you didn't stumble upon this man. And if so, you probably know that every time the Honorable Dr. Martinson opens his mouth, he will use the words Rule of the octave. 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 Rule of the octave is so important. To a certain degree it absolutely is, but there is a huge amount of baroque music where this device contributes very little to the overall organization of a piece. And the presence and status of the rule of the octave in the current Partimento scene conveys at least to some extent a distorted view on the compositional reality of that era. At least for the style of Corelli I'm willing to say that you're able to make a decent living without it. It's not just the case that in pieces like this you will find very few situations that can be described as outright are all progressions. Let's say this tiny 7-1 on the bottom and if you want count the lamento in. This piece shows like most other trio sonata movements a tightly knit network of smaller overlapping contrapuntal units and I'd say that the general compositional process can be described as a fluent and dexterous interconnection of them. A vertical or chordal concept like the rule of the octave provides just doesn't really capture the mechanical dynamic of the composition itself nor the process of arranging this. And that actually goes for a lot of pieces that show an obvious chordal approach. Let's take this one as everybody is familiar with it. The very few outright rule of the octave progressions I can spot in the whole piece are actually part of bigger schematic building blocks that supersede the local chord to chord approach. You probably know that for some this is the textbook example of a page one, desk and cadence, lully or whatever you want to call this. The other situation can as well be described as a sequence on the tight bass and for some people this will be a Fonte. And before people raise their eyebrows and think this is becoming the Fox News of Partimento now, 
I'm totally aware that these passages can as well be taken as textbook examples to demonstrate how rule of the octave modules and contrapuntal building blocks commonly can make up a structural interaction. But as well in the case of this fonte, the primary compositional decision is to pick up the fonte as pre-existing syntactical entity and the choral texture is more like a secondary byproduct that's been applied due to the figurative texture of the piece. So as well, no autonomous rule of the octave progressions. If you're now asking, is it counterpoint or chords? Well, I actually can't tell myself anymore. What I'm trying to say is, it's better not to overestimate certain concepts and a reality check every now and then doesn't hurt. Otherwise, Partimento itself is running into danger of becoming another ideology on tonal music, pretty much like 20th century harmony theory, that especially in the context of Partimento often has been criticized as self-referential discipline that lost touch with the very object it actually tries to describe and illuminate. Thanks for watching, see you next time.